we are still doing longevity practices. So this one is longevity practice number four. And this one is peptide therapy. Never heard of peptides? Well, they're strings of amino acids. Cutting age therapy, although we've been using certain types of peptide therapy, oh, since the late 2008, 9, 10 era. So we got involved with uh, what I was doing in 2015 after I went to an age manage management medical conference in Orlando, Florida, and finally was around people that spoke my language. I felt like I was among people that thought the way that I do. So what are the peptides? They're short chains, amino acids, they form a protein. So peptides, another name for protein, and peptides work at the cellular level, and they have a significant effect on aging and disease and overall general health. So lots of health issues can be impacted with peptide therapy. Inflammation, the basis of most chronic disease, diabetes, rampant over 100 million people in the U.S. have difficulty with insulin in some fashion, either resistance or if not type 2 diabetes. Healing processes, cellular DNA function, arthritis, they're being used in different types of health conditions, they can encourage production of growth hormone, which is kind of what we've focused on for the past nine years. So reduction in inflammation, reduction in autoimmune disease, growth hormone for the slowing down of the aging process. <clears throat> I always hesitate to say reversal of aging because chronologically we continue to age, but we can slow down the aging process. So you can use peptides for the treatment of obesity. You all have heard of semaglutides and all those medications and the shots that have been hot in the press for 2023 and continuing. That is a peptide. GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, or the semaglutides. Others can encourage the death of excess fat cells. Some peptides can decrease wrinkles and make skin look younger. So topical, although most of the time these peptides are given as a subcutaneous medication. And is it really a medication if it's just a peptide? Yes and no. So it's interesting to me that you can take a supplement by mouth and get it over the counter. So vitamins, for instance, vitamin C, N-acetylcysteine, several glutathione, you can take it by mouth without a prescription. If you want to get it as a shot, you have to have a prescription. So they can be compounded into injectable forms. There are some centers that do this type of therapy intravenously, but we're going to focus specifically on the peptides for age management. So they can be therapeutic for different types of problems and slow down the aging process. A guy in St. Louis, 61, 62 years old, if you met him, you would think he was about 40, and he has been on a human growth hormone, releasing hormone agonist. Agonist means it is propagating human growth hormone or acting like human growth hormone, releasing hormone. So they're safe, they're effective. You can grow hair. This guy, has, you know, he was getting thinning hair. He's also on testosterone which is a steroid, but with his human growth hormone releasing hormone, his hair color has come back and his thinning hair has gone away. People can recover from injuries faster. You can improve cognitive function. You can reverse insulin problems. You know, Alzheimer's dementia is now called type 3 diabetes. You can stimulate libido, improve athletic performance. Other people use peptides to aid with their sleep reduce muscle and joint inflammation, increase mental clarity and energy. So what type of peptides am I talking about? So I'm going to show you a couple of them for you to think about and learn some stuff. The peptides that we've used the most are sermorelin, epimorelin, and those are human growth hormone releasing hormone or growth hormone secretogs. So they stimulate growth hormone release, and they use your physiology, negative feedback loops, to figure out whether or not if your growth hormone is lower than it should be, these secretors, these agonists, so they stimulate growth hormone production. If your body monitors and finds that your growth hormone levels are declining or suboptimal. And then there's a 
built-in safety mechanism, really. I mean, if you know anything about negative feedback loops, things shut down. So if your growth hormone level comes up to a good level, we can give you all the sermorelin or epimorelin that we want to, and your pituitary gland will not respond to it. The idea is to get you up into an optimal level and then keep you there, back off the amount of injections that you need, and monitor that. So for samorolin uh, and ifamorolin, we usually start off with measuring uh, an IGF-1 level, and that tells us whether or not it's made in the liver in response to growth hormone. You can also do growth hormone levels. Uh, they're going to show as normal as you get older, because as you get older, your growth hormone levels go down. So IGF-1 less than 200, maybe 160, 160, 165, you would probably respond to samorolin or, or epimorolin. Uh, I had a guy several years ago, he was right at 200. We tried it for a couple of months. It didn't budge him at all. He didn't feel anything. You know, when you're younger, your IGF-1 level is usually 250, 300, 325. So the idea is to get that IGF-1 level up over 200. And the very first thing that we see or hear is mental clarity and sleep. So within a month, the clients and patients that I've dealt with taking human growth hormone, releasing hormone, tell me they sleep like a baby, like they haven't slept this well in years. And then they focus, they get mental clarity. Some of the other benefits come down the pike. And if you do this, most people that use samorolin and epimorolin recommend the six-month treatment to start. So that would be a subcutaneous shot every night before you go to bed. So you take this at night about 10 p.m., a little injection, sort of like if you were doing an insulin injection in your lower belly. doesn't hurt. You, it's very simple to do. I've done it many times that I don't like needles. So let's look at some of the literature on just dietary peptides and just peptides in general to see what's out there. So the first one we're going to look at is just dietary uh, peptide use. So dietary peptides and aging. This is from Canada. And then if you want to look it up, it's food and science, human wellness, number nine from 2020, dietary peptides and aging, evidence and prospects. And one of the things that they review in here, aging, an inevitable part of life defined as a progressive and global decline of physiologic functions, leading to vulnerability to disease, decline in health span. And remember, during this series, we're not necessarily trying to get you to live longer if you get sick. So the idea is to improve your health span. So people have been trying to do this for a long time. So if you look here, 1939, restraint of caloric intake in mice and rats increases lifespan. You've heard me say before, stop eating all the time. Quit eating all the time. It's not necessarily the caloric restriction. Of course, that was 80 some years ago. It is the fact that you're resting your gut. So we're talking about time-restricted eating. So you have to have some time to process. You have to sleep well. You have to let your autophagy occur. Um, autophagy is cellular repair, which occurs during sleep. So if you're eating stuff like bedtime snacks, your body, while you're trying to sleep, is dealing with all that and not paying attention to cleaning up debris uh, and get, getting rid of things that are actually sort of aging you. So 1952, age related to natural selection and reproduction. References here, the next achievement, late 80s, focusing on the identification of genetic basis of disease. And then the last 30 years, tremendous progress in the aging research, including identification of insulin-like signaling pathway, so IGF-1, the target of rapamycin, or mTOR, that pathway, sirtuins, and we talked about sirtuins, and then the mitochondrial model of aging. There's about 150 identified mitochondrial dysfunctions that can cause illness and aging. And the mitochondria may actually be the most important thing you need to work on as you get older. And then inflam aging. So I keep telling you, inflammation causes chronic disease. Well, it does. There it is, inflammaging. Okay, so this article goes through metabolic function, aging biomarkers, and I'll show you, for instance, in this uh, report from 2020, they're looking at soy, egg yolks, quinoa, uh, whey peptides, lentil, 
all those and we're not they're not talking about shots they're talking about dietary modification and so mTOR activation AMPK we talked about with uh, dietary uh, longevity practice number three that improves your metabolic function AMPK so if you're eating all the time or if you're heavy your AMPK is being inactivated you can reactivate it by with eating all the time you can activate it by taking berberine, you don't get that with metformin, although my collaborative doctor would probably argue with me about that. The history of mTOR is interesting. I might do a whole video just on that because it's becoming uh, more and more noticed among age researchers and looking at cancer, which is increased and surged in people under 50 in the past 20 to 30 years, like an 80% increase in cancer incidence in people under the age of 50. So bioactive peptides, so this is bio, bioactive peptides, things you can eat. So all this gobbledygook here, what they're trying to do is avoid uh, reactive oxygen species damage. So that's the inflammation from free radicals which is sort of kind of falling not in disfavor, but maybe not as important as mitochondrial dysfunction. So getting back to a healthy cell, they're man trying to manage oxidative homeostasis to get to a healthy cell. So think of autophagy while you're sleeping and then CERT1, the sirtuins, AMPK, uh, denison monophosphate protein kinase is what that stands for, and mTOR involved with rapamycin. You are using these peptides, you're improving your insulin sensitivity. So if you're eating all the time and you're eating a lot of carbohydrates and snacking between meals and taking a bedtime snack, you're going to become insulin res uh, resistant. So we want to improve insulin sensitivity, improve your liver function, try to avoid or reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which used to be almost always just from alcohol. Fatty liver disease, fatty liver cirrhosis was all alcohol. And now non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from insulin resistance is rampant. I mean, it's epidemic. So now let's look at what they're doing with testosterone. So this one is from PubMed again, a urology journal 2020. Looking beyond the androgen receptor, which is what your androgen means, male hormone. So this is the role of growth hormone secretogs, somorlin, epimorlin, and modern management of body composition in hypogonadal males, so men with low testosterone. And remember, low testosterone isn't a number. It's based on symptomatology. So what you're trying to get is an optimal testosterone as you age. Testosterone replacement's been around since 1939. Research-wise, it's not controversial. Television commercials make it sound controversial, but all the things that they say testosterone causes are really caused by low testosterone or suboptimal testosterone uh, levels as you age. And you lose 3% a year starting about the age of 30. So by the time you're 50, you're going to start having problems. You might feel it in your 40s. People focus on erectile dysfunction, which is really a blood flow thing as well as testosterone. But in your 50s, you start getting insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and hypertension and a rise in cardiovascular risk from suboptimal testosterone levels. And men under 60, based on a, a publication from Harvard in 1988, have a 15% risk of having invasive cancer, the prostate. So a lower testosterone level under the age of 60, specifically a total testosterone level less than 350. So essential hormone for male sexual, mental, and physical development, in addition to ongoing health. It's a clinical syndrome characterized by a lower, not necessarily low, but lower serum testosterone levels found in conjunction with clinical sy symptoms, which were delineated about 20 years ago by St. Louis University in the atom scoring or androgen deficiency in the aging male, which kind of leads you, if somebody has a positive result on that test or that questionnaire,
their testosterone level is suboptimal. So reduced ma bone mass, increased fat mass, hosts of other metabolic disturbances. And notice male obesity is linked to lower gonadal function. They're more susceptible to rapid fat accumulation. So think of the little lower punch that everybody thinks is a beer gut, and most frequently it is from lower testosterone levels. And then obese men, if you start out, have an increased risk of hypogonadism given that adipose tissue has an aromatase enzyme which converts testosterone to estradiol. And we have to watch that for men that are on testosterone replacement to make sure that they're not aromatizing to estrogens. So you can read this whole thing. Here's the link up here. So if you want to look at the whole thing, translational andrology and urology, what they're showing in the abstract here is somarlin, growth hormone releasing peptides, GHR2P6, GHRP6, uh, and ifamorlin, potent growth hormone and IGF-1 stimulators that can significantly improve body composition while ameliorating specific symptoms, including fat gain and muscular atrophy. So the longer that you're on, I'm going to focus on somorlin and ifamorlin, the better your muscular development, athletic performance, and your mood stabilizes. So like I said, better sleep, <clears throat> better mental acuity and focus almost within a month. Like everybody after a month will tell me that. And then working out at gyms, some of these men are also on testosterone therapy. Some just do uh, sermorlin and they do fine. They keep looking at clinical effects of these compounds. So what is the growth hormone secret tog role in the treatment of men with hypogonadism just by itself? So that's what they're looking at in this particular article. Overall, peptide therapy is a thing, and it gets more and more attention. You might not have heard of it, but it's been going on now for at least 15 years. That's longevity practice number four. Have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Bye.